What's the balance of words that build and words that destroy? What are you attending to and are you properly attending to it? I can't really navigate this world by myself and no one really could. We, we really need each other. Human beings are inclined towards the good. I don't have to explain it. I just believe it. I change my mind a lot because we grow up. That moment of using words not well during the day and then using the words at night, I'm sorry, was a game changer. Welcome to The Power Of with Noam Weissman. From Unpacked, I'm Noam Weissman, and you're listening to The Power Of. This week, The Power Of Success. The Power Of is brought to you thanks to our generous Platinum Level supporters, the Mayberg Foundation and David and Deborah Magerman, as well as our additional Gold Level supporters, Cheryl and Gerald Hartman, and Bronze Level supporters, the Crane Mailing Foundation. To sponsor future episodes, email us at podcasts at jewishunpacked.com. There is a Jewish principle that I've gotten wrong my whole life life. In Hebrew, the principle is known as Dan et kol ha'adam lekav zechu. Typically, we translate that as give people the benefit of the doubt. Even if you see them doing something wrong, assume the best. So yeah, like probably many of us, I'm not great at this. But it's even more than that. I actually think that for over 30 years, I fundamentally misunderstood this principle. I recently heard a transformational understanding of this idea from Rebbe Nachman of Breslov. If you don't know Rebbe Nachman, introduction made. Here's what he says about this line. It's not about the benefit of the doubt for the particular thing or the moment. Dan lekaf zechu means look at the whole person. Consider the totality of the individual. Dan et kol ha'adam, judge the whole person. But Rebbe Nachman goes further. He says that this whole principle is not just about others, it's about ourselves. When we look inward, don't focus on only one thing, on the failures, on the ways we screwed up. Remember to focus on ourselves as whole people, the sum of so much. To be Don Lakaf Zahut for ourselves means that when we look in the mirror, we have to see the good inside of us. In the moment of failure, Let's treat ourselves charitably. When we fail, we need that person who loves us so much to say, you're a success. Don't define yourselves by this moment. I failed a lot. I've also accomplished a lot. And I'm fascinated by the topic of failure. When I was a classroom teacher, I tried to normalize failure for my students. When the kids got a question wrong, I had them shout, I made a mistake. I'd hear them yelling in the hallways, I made a mistake. It was cute, yes. But it was something so much bigger. It's normalizing a lack of perfection. We have so much anxiety that we need to perform perfectly. That it will say something about my personhood, my character, if I don't. And what happens when I don't, when I'm not perfect, as none of us are? Pain, crippling anxiety, for some depression, shutting down, not being able to cope. For this conversation, I wanted one person and one person only former NBA player Mike Sweetney. If you did not follow Sweetney's basketball career, it looked like this. Star player in high school, went to Georgetown for college following some of the greats like Patrick Ewing, Alonzo Mourning, and Allen Iverson. Mike excelled there, averaging almost 20 points a game. Georgetown is doing a bad job of getting the ball to Mike Sweetney. He should touch it every possession. Sweetney got it back. Sweetney put it up and in for his time. As a junior, he ranked in the top 20 in both scoring and rebounding. The only player that year to do so. And after three years of college ball, Mike was ready for the next move. He declared for the 2003 draft. You know that draft that LeBron James went in, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh. And he was selected by the New York Knicks, probably the most famous franchise in American sports with a ninth overall pick. Amazing. He was doing it, living the dream. I mean, he looks up at the shot clock. Nice up and under move from Michael Sweetney. He's got nine points here in the opening. Success, right? But then something went terribly wrong in his career. And Mike thought, that's it. I'm not a success. I'm a failure. But boy, was he wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you someone who embodies what true success as a person looks like, the ultimate mensch, Mike Sweetney. Mike Sweetney, so excited to have you on on The Power Of. 
where we're going to be speaking about success and we're going to be speaking about failure, obviously. So could you tell us why you chose to speak about success with us? Yeah, I think uh, things that I went through in my personal life uh, on getting success. Um, I worked so hard starting off playing basketball at the age of nine. And uh, for me, um, I was dreaming of being a professional basketball player since I was nine, 10 years old. Yeah. Once I became able to work hard and got lucky enough to become successful and make the NBA, I wanted to tell people like, yes, you know, you got to work hard to be successful, but there's a lot that comes with it. And are you able to handle that mentally? And, um, and I think a lot of, we see that with professional athletes, you see that people in the entertainment world, uh, politicians, it's a lot when you become even just the CEO of a company or just in general, you know, it has to be, had to be, a top title to be successful on this and you know, whatever you claim is success, you know, once you get there, there are a lot of responsibilities that come with that. And uh, are we able to handle that? I love that. Like once you get there as though getting to the NBA, becoming CEO, okay, now I got there, that's success. And there are challenges that came along with that. So I want to, I'm, we're, we're going to talk about that. I want to ask you if you're able to give a 90 second version of your life story, what's the story of Mike Sweetney? Wow, that's amazing. Um, good. <laughs> so pretty much, um, like I said before, you know, a kid that dreamed of playing basketball and making it to NBA. Um, my father introduced me to that game of basketball. Um, I loved it. And uh, once I was able to make it, um, you know, I went from Georgetown, playing at Georgetown University, being an All-American, to being lucky enough to be the number nine pick in the 2003 NBA draft. Uh, the same thing, same draft as LeBron and Carmelo and Dwayne Wade. So, so much was expected of me and uh, things didn't go the way I planned. Right. I got the success of making it to NBA, but I wasn't able to handle the downfalls of it, of, you know, losing my father, um, dealing with adversity and um, dealt with depression, lost my NBA career and was able to pick myself back up. Uh, it took years, but I had to put the work in and do everything possible to be a better person. So, um, you know, it was like, the you know, the being at the low and total pole, being high, and then being back low and then picking yeah. yourself back up. That's the story of Michael Sweetney, the, um, the roller coaster. But Michael Sweetney, I'm going to push back to your story because you didn't include something about your story. You didn't, you didn't include as part of your story the, your, your wife and your children. And I know from knowing you how important they are to you. Oh, most definitely. Um, my wife, we actually met in high school. We met in ninth grade. We started off as best friends. So, and so she saw me when I was able to go through college and make it to the pros. But she's also was there the day I lost my father. Um, she was the first person that I called. Um, and she was actually living with me at the, at the, at the time. So she was <laughs> one that took me back home from New York to Maryland uh, to, you know, obviously deal with the loss of my father. And she stayed by my side, even during my depression. Still to this day, I tell people in a joking way, I don't know how she stayed married. <laughs> I shut down from everybody. I was in a dark place. So just, you know, her being by my side. And then obviously she gave me three blessings of children who literally changed my life. And just try to, you know, have that unit. Because for me, that's all that matters. Just making sure that my wife and kids are, you know, happy and healthy and taken care of. And just, you know, being that family unit. I love it. Yeah, that's a huge part of your story. And when I think of success and I think of failure, uh, I, 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 I want to kind of go back into my youth and go back into my childhood and think about, you know, little Noam and maybe little Mike in terms of what we were imagining success looking like. And I think you and I are around the same age. I'm 36 and I say I'm older. You're old. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're similar ages. I'm not sure that the way I viewed success then is exactly the way I view success now. I think the way I viewed success as a teenager or as a preteen, I think I, th I thought about success as reaching a certain place. And then once I reached that place, then that would be success. Like as though success was a static moment, becoming CEO of an organization, becoming the head of something, earning X amount of dollars, uh, whatever the thing is. I, I bought my first house. Um, I bought my first car. Like we view success as we reach a moment and that moment is the apex. And if we're being honest with ourselves now as 36 and 39 year olds, it's not like we've achieved all the wisdom in the world. But I think that that is, I, I want to say a juvenile approach to viewing success. Because if we look at adults in our lives, I look at my friends, I look at, you know, family, whomever, I look at myself. And what I see is many people have reached that apex. And you know what they want to do? 
They want to go to some of the local spiritual guru. They want to speak to the that person who knows everything about happiness and whatever it is. And they want to listen and sit at that person's feet. Because you know why? They're not happy still. And they may have, quote unquote, become successful in their career, which means they earn X number of dollars or they've achieved Y things. But if there's not a sense of feeling good about oneself, feeling content, then what makes that person successful? Do, does what I just said resonate with you? Do you see it things differently? I agree 1000%. Pretty much like you said, it's like um, some people, a lot of people put success as in material things. Like you say, okay. uh, if I can be this you know, top level CEO, I have this big home, I have this big car, I have this amount of money in my bank account, I'm successful. But you know, you can be successful with the material things on the outside where people see, but if the inside of you are, you know, you're hurting, you're crying, you're 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 depressed, you're you're not happy with life, things are not going well, you know, you're you're you know, you want all these fancy things, but you know, if you're a CEO of a company, I mean some depending on what the situation is, you might not be home. You know, if you're yeah. spending 12, 14 hours away from your wife and your kids or your family, whoever you may be, you know. A lot of times it's not a happy situation and they might not be happy. Your kids are missing you. Your wife is complaining. You're not home so much. And so it can cause a lot to come with it. So like I said before, if you want those things, but can you handle what comes with it? And are you mentally prepared? And one of the, you know, John, Dern, uh, old Georgetown guy, John Dern and Patrick Ewan, before I went to the NBA draft, they kind of mentioned the same thing. Like, are you mentally ready for this? I didn't right. know what they were talking. I was like, man, I made it to the NBA, man, I'm good. And I didn't yeah. really understand, like, Things that come with it, the media responsibilities, the fan responsibilities, you know, trying to take care of your family. So much that goes along with it. Are you ready to for that? You know, right. I thought I was successful. Then I realized, like, you know, I'm empty inside. So I, what- I agree. I agree with you. One thousand percent It's it's more, you know, it's more so. Success is, you know, how you feel inside. If you're happy with yourself and, you know, you're spiritually and mentally in a good place. I think that's success because once you're, you know, I'm sure, you know. You know, when your mind is a good place, everything else follows. Yeah. And, you know, you can run 30 miles a day and be in the best shape of your life. But inside of your hurting, that's that balance is just not going to equal out. So I think, you know, the mind taking care of that mind is the most successful thing you can do in life. And I, and I think we're still speaking about it from a very specific lens, which is success in career or success monetarily or, you know, having material things. I've known who you are, Mike you know, for, I'm 36, like I said, I've known you for at least 20 years. Uh, You didn't know me, but I've known you. And it's, here's how I knew you. I knew you because I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, and I heard your name at the the Capitol Classic, which is, for those who don't know, there's the McDonald's uh, All-American basketball game, which is the top high school players. And then there's the other top high school player game, which is called the Capital Classic. Is that right, Mike? Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, one hundred percent accurate. Yeah. And and you were you were co MVPs of that game together with Tamir Goodman. Yep. <laughs> right. So Tamir Goodman grew up down the block from me. That guy was butter out there. He was he was smooth. His jumper, his court vision, and the story in the Jewish world was Tamir Goodman going to University of Maryland and then not working out, going to Towson. Um, difficult things happened to him there. Uh, and then he went to play professionally in Israel, got injured. And your stories, you know, you went to Georgetown, you went to the New York Knicks. Y- your stories as professional players perhaps didn't turn out the way both of you would have imagined it when you were 17, 18 years old. But when I look at the story of Mike Sweetney and I look at the story of Tamir Goodman, I, the way I view you guys is remarkable successes as people, like people that I want my child to meet. I more want my child to meet someone like you, someone like Tamir, spend time with you guys, than to spend time with someone else who may have made more money in the NBA, who may have averaged more points per game in the NBA. So why are, why are we viewing success as that person, as opposed to Tamir and Mike, who I look at and I'm like, Oh my God, I just want my child to spend time with you. You know what I'm saying? That's what I view as success. No, I, I agree 1000%. And uh, I, I even see that, that fruit of that, that labor now when um, I'm trained. A lot of times, I'm, you know, parents send me their child to work with them basketball wise. And most of the time, it turns, yes, it's, I'm doing skill work, but also it turns into a personal level where, 
you know, that child may be going through anxiety or that child may be depressed. Yeah. Or that child is trying to find their way in life. And next, you know, I, I, and for me, I'm not bragging, but I had a, I had a story with a situation I was working with. Them. Brag, brag away. Are you kidding me? Bra- go. With that per- this kid's one kid had very, very low self-esteem. They just felt like they, they didn't, couldn't play basketball well at all. They just, they wasn't fitting in. And next thing you know, you know, after about a eight months of work, which is this conversation and playing basketball together, this kid ended up making a basketball team. This kid is the second leading scorer in a team. Um, this kid is fitting in with the friends. Wow. They, they, wow. They, they having conversation with kids where they wasn't even comfortable having conversations with kids. So just the little things where it just, you know, me, and it was also just me just being vulnerable to this kid, kind of sharing a little bit more of my details, what I experienced in life. And um, I think it just kind of changed this kid's life because I was just spending time and just being humble. Like, hey, look, yeah. yes, I was an NBA player. This is what I went through. And like that right there kind of gave me so much like joy in life. Uh, it's unbelievable. You- yeah, you change, you're changing another human being's life. That's an unbelievable part of Mike Sweetney's story. You're also a coach on the YU basketball team, the Yeshiva University basketball team, and you're doing incredible things there and making, making big moves there. I want to learn some Torah with you, with your permission. Yep. So there is an idea in Mishle, which is Proverbs. It's a famous line. And it talks about the fact that baked into the DNA of success is failure. It's inescapable. Here's what it says. Seven times the righteous person falls and gets up while the wicked are tripped by one misfortune. So there's an incredible thinker. His name is Rabbi Yitzchak Hutner. He wrote a book called the Pachad Yitzchak. It's called Pachad Yitzchak. And here's what he says. The unlearned think that this means even though a righteous person falls seven times, he will rise. Even though the wise know well that the meaning is because a righteous person falls seven times, he will rise. The insight is that it's not that, oh, even if someone makes a mistake a number of times, eventually they could still get up and let's go. It's saying the opposite, that intrinsic to success, the the inherent nature of being successful requires failure. Mike Sweetney wouldn't have been able to impact and influence this human being, this student of yours, without the failures that you've gone through. That's a reality. Is that, isn't that true? So I, I agree 1,000% on that. And uh, when the time when I was at one of my lowest, lowest points, um, one of my mentors kind of told me, he was like, hey, yeah, I know you may not understand this now. You want to hear it. But one day you're going to look back at this moment and say, this is the moment that changed your life because you're, you, know, you learned, you had these downfalls, you know how to handle it. And one day you want to change somebody else's life. That's so right. At the time, I'm like, all right, man, get out of here. I'm not trying to hear all that because <laughs> I was just so in a dark place. And now I look back at it, I was like, wow, like, I'm glad what happened to me, my failures, you know, happened to me because right. at that time I had people in my life that shouldn't have been in my life. So now they're not. That's one. Two, I'm able to happen, you know, share my experiences with other people to help change their life. So hopefully they won't have to have those same mistakes. I mean, obviously everybody's going to have downfalls and mistakes, but if I can stop them from making the ones that I made, then that can that can be a you know a good you know situation. So um, for me, that what you just read, that was my life. <laughs> yeah, and I said I, I hope people don't think that I'm crazy for saying it. I'm glad that I had those failures. Again, from a personal level, I, I've seen your attentiveness to your own children. I've seen how you are in front of other people. It's not my job to say you are a success or not as a person, but that's a journey. To be successful is a journey. What you're like at 45, at 55, at 65, and so on and so forth. You're going to constantly be evaluating whether or not you're living up to that, the goals, the dreams of what Mike Sweetney wants to be accomplishing and, and, and what I want to be accomplishing. There, there's one idea that I've been thinking a lot about with regard to failure and success. When I was in grad school, I was in a class and in the class, they asked us not to write our resumes, but our failure resumes. I loved this idea. A failure resume. And they did a five whys of an analysis. And so the one that I chose was law school. I had always planned to go to a top 20 law school. When I was seven years old, my grandfather said to me, Noam, I want you to be a corporate lawyer. I'm like, can I have more ice cream, please? And he's like, Noam, not only do I want you to be a corporate lawyer, I want you to be a corporate lawyer in, in Manhattan, in New York City. And in my mind, I think I always was gonna do that. Like I was gonna be a corporate attorney in New York City. 
And when I was applying to law school, I got into some fine schools, good schools, but not into the top 20 schools that I imagined I would get into. And I include the five whys as to why I didn't accomplish what I set out to accomplish. And it's my failure resume. So I want to piggyback on something you said. I love that idea of the, the putting out there your failures. Because a lot of times when you go on you know, social media, a lot of people will say, will show like all the great things they're going in life. Oh, I just bought this new car. I just got this new house. I got this new promotion. I just bought this jewelry. I, everybody's showing all the things they got and how they're successful. Nobody's showing like, okay, you got this new promotion. But how many times have you tried for that promotion and probably got denied for it? Or how many times okay. have you, you know, try to get a loan for this house and, you know, two mortgage companies probably told you, no, you're not showing that stuff. You're just showing the set. So I agree with you. Like a lot of people need to show their, you know, their, their, their you know, their downfalls. But my wife, for instance, she's uh, wrote two, she wrote a couple of TV scripts and she had pitches with a couple of uh, TV stations and four wow. of the stations came back and said, no. And she was like devastated. And she's like, why are you so calm? I said, you know, because I feel like at some point you may get your chance. But, you know, yeah. I said, you know, some people get told no. I mean, how many I'm sure most of these actors and writers probably a select few, but have been told yes right away. So it's one of those things you just keep pushing. You keep, you know, keep finding your way. And OK, they said no. Why do they say no? You know, let, let, let's find a way. So, like, not many people get the things they need right away. Sometimes there are steps to it and, and you get told no, there are failures. You know, yep. or maybe you know, so it's one of those things. So I agree with you one thousand percent that that has to be put out there a lot more. What about in the classroom for your own children? I think as a parent, it's really difficult in many ways to see your child fail in something. And on the other hand, there's a value to it. With I think it really helps uh, with persistence if it's in a if it's in a healthy culture. So there's a there's a there's a rabbi named Jonathan Sachs who said that failure is the supreme learning experience and the best people, the true heroes, are those most willing to fail. Even more than the strength to win, we need the courage to try, the willingness to fail, the readiness to learn, and this is the key line, and the faith to persist. So for your wife, it's all about that faith to persist. That's what it's about. Falling is not failing. No, I, I agree. So uh, I do think a lot of our young children need to learn about, you know, failure or not getting everything you need right away, get everything you want right away. Because um, I think there's a lot of struggles right now, you know, with our society, with a lot of kids. A lot of kids don't know how to handle adversity. Um, yeah. They don't understand when something goes wrong, it's not the end of the world. It's okay. You failed the test. You didn't get into the school you want to get into. Or your friend made the team and you didn't. Like, it's okay. You know, The worst thing we could do, Mike, I think, I'm just riffing for a second right now, I think the worst thing we could do is to blame other people for our children's failures. I'm using this almost metaphorically. A culture in which we blame the refs is not the way to encourage the cultivation of success and the willingness to allow your child to fail. So I'm going to give you an example. So my, my middle son, he's uh, eight. Um, yeah. We just found out he has dyslexia. Now, mathematics and everything else, and computers, <laughs> he's a genius. Yeah. So when it came to writing, he just couldn't get it right. His reading, he was struggling. And, um, you know, he was so down on himself and this, that, and the other. It, it was, like, really hard on him. And for him, I kept saying, hey, buddy, you know, we're going to get through this. We're going to figure it out. And we eventually got him some professional testing and found out, okay, this is what's going on. Yeah. And for me, at the time, watching him cry and struggle, it bothered me for sure. But deep down, I was like, okay, I'm glad he's going through this at this age because now he's learning, okay, yeah, I'm failing right now. I'm not doing well. And he kept pushing through, and he we found that he found the avenue. Okay, this is what I have to do. I see things differently than most people. He figured it out, and now he's like starting and progressing. He's doing well. What did you do as a parent to help him fail well? Um, I told him. I mean, I kind of told him. I wasn't. I'm not, I'm not that harsh parent. But I was. I would say, hey, buddy, it's okay. Right. And I said, I'm glad. You, and I told. Him, I said, I'm glad you're going through this at a young age. I said because daddy, growing up, you know, I'm not comparing basketball to schoolwork, but you know, growing up, I never had adversity. I was just making basketball teams. Everything was going well. School was going well. And it hit adversity hit me at 20 years old. <laughs> so, yeah. and I didn't know how to handle it. You know, right. so I said, I'm glad you're learning. And I, and I told him my story. I said, Daddy struggled. And so I'm right. glad you're learning at, you know, at eight years old that, right. okay, you know, things are not going to go my way. And he's done it well. And for my other two children, my youngest daughter, my oldest son, they saw him go through this. Yeah. And, they, and they're seeing, okay, everything is not always going to be great. 
Yeah. And now my son and oldest son, he's struggling. He's struggling with something in class and he figured he's okay. We all struggle. That's the point. We all struggle. So I, I want to end with a few other questions that, you know, some silly, some not. From your 2003 NBA draft, going back to that for a second, are you still shocked that like Carmelo and LeBron are still playing? Is that, is that wild? Am I shocked? No. You know, it's one of those things That's- like LeBron, I'm sure you heard your story. He was kind of ahead of his time. Like, you know, this kid, yeah. you know, high school, you know, come out of college, we still eating fast food. We don't know about healthy food and stuff like this guy's <laughs> eating fruit and stretching. I'm like, why are you stretching, dude? You have to stretch, you know, just all yeah. those things he, you watched him do at the workout. It's like, wow. Like, you know, yeah. now you look back on it, like he was ahead of his time. So yeah. he knew how to take care of his body at a young age. And Carmelo was just a, you know, he got his body in great shape and he's an amazing talent. So, you know, just having those type of guys around, I'm, I'm definitely excited you see those guys, but I think um, I don't. You know, we we worked out. We we worked off about four days before the draft. And you mean just, you you worked out with LeBron and Carmelo before the draft? Yep. And just seeing LeBron's IQ level, you were like, wow, this dude is really. You know, eighteen years old. You know, whatever, I think he was eighteen, seventeen, eighteen years old. Yeah. Whatever he was at the time, he was almost like a thirty year old man in the mind. <laughs> like it right. was just crazy. Like, and it's one of those things. Moments like everybody knew. He was right. Next. Like you kind of yeah. knew. Like okay. This guy is up next. So just me being able to see that up front before the world got a chance to see it on that level was amazing. And just uh, and Dwayne Wade was another shocker. I think Dwayne Wade was one of those guys nobody really knew about. And I watched him a little bit in college. In the tournament, he was great. Yes, in the tournament. So that's why a lot of people see him. But I saw him, well, obviously, he was at Marquette, you yeah. know, whatever. So I saw him, you know, I watched him a little bit. I was like, wow, okay, this guy is pretty darn good. Like, you know, who is this kid? And, like, you know, you start to see things, and I'm like, this guy's going to be good. And just seeing how fast he was in person, how athletic and strong he was. So you kind of knew it's like he, him and LeBron, you kind of knew like, okay, right. these guys are going to be the face of the league. And so just being able to see that up front and just see these guys, of, you know, meet him personally was amazing for me. From your perspective, the guys that you've seen both at Yeshiva University and at the NBA level, like let's say Ryan Terrell or Aton Halpert, do they have a different type of mental strength that you were able to look at and be like okay it's not just physical these guys are going to be able to accomplish something that's different because of their mental fortitude uh their mental is probably as strong as anybody um right okay if you told ryan terrell and Aton how right now hey do you think you can be you know lebron 101 or chris yeah. paul 101 yeah they're going to say yes and they're going to really believe that <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. their comp level is so high and guys feed off that <laughs> Um, right. you know, I work out with Ryan sometimes, like we'll do like post work and stuff like that. And I'm guarding him and I see him, you know, he's talking trash to me. And I'm like, <laughs> back in my mind, like, dude, like, uh, but like this, their confidence level, like they think they can beat anybody and they believe that. And, you know, I love that about them. Like, you know, they're not disrespectful and not in a disrespectful way. And then guys, it feeds off of guys. Like I'll see guys, I'll just see times where in practice, you know, a game where we're slacking, we're sluggish and like you can. Aton and, and Ryan will get to start talking and saying things and, and they, they they not only they do it with their, their mouth, they do it with their actions too. Yeah, I gotta say one more thing about Aton Halpert because I love the guy. And he didn't have a great game. And he one one game, he didn't have a great game. And he said to me after the game, he said, If I second guess my shot for a second, I'm I'm out. And what he meant is he's saying that the best athletes have the it's a famous line the best athletes have the memories of a goldfish they forget meaning they gone through their failure they messed up okay next game next up and that's what it means to be a great athlete i think it's what it means to be a great a great person the ability to say okay you know i i'm able to absolutely grow from that moment move on from it and go on to the next thing i want to ask you one more question coach um who do you think not including you, is my favorite player from the 2003 NBA draft. I'm 100% sure you're not going to get this right. I'm going to go on a limb and say Kendrick Perkins or David West. It's Troy Bell. Do you remember him? Boston College? Yes, right? Boston College. I played against him. So you, you did? How'd you do? How'd you do against him? Well, he was a guard, but he lit us yeah. up. <laughs> he, I, think I, I think he won both games I played against him. Okay. At like 30, but he's a... A great, great player, and he's one of those guys. I'm surprised he didn't have a long career in the NBA because he was yeah. like super, super talented. Can shoot it, dribble strong, and he he's a good player. Yeah, when I was in high school, and listen, 
listen, I played high school basketball, so you know I know what it's like, right, coach? No, but uh, <laughs> I, I would, I would, I would try to emulate Troy Bell. He was a guy. I was like, that's a guy. Uh, I like, I like that guy's game. Anyway, coach Mike Sweetney, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about success and about failure, about how Judaism and Jewish thought can help us think about all of these ideas. And I hope you take the wisdom of the Pachad Yitzchak with you uh, in your life, because it's, it's absolutely, the way I view it, it's absolutely a healthy and important way to view life, which is to not think of the fact that even though we, f- we fail, ultimately we rise, it's because we fail, we rise. And uh, that's the story of, the, what's the way I view the story of Mike Sweetney. Actually, I want to say thank you because I actually learned some things today. So I appreciate you. Um, with, and so with that, I don't want to pronounce it wrong, but I want to say thank you so much. Uh, my Hebrew is very, I struggle a lot with the Hebrew, so I don't even try to pronounce certain words, but I'll just say thank you so much. Uh, I'm the same way. That was some great education for me today. So thank you. Thanks so much, coach. Really appreciate it. Anytime. Thank you guys. Okay, you guys know me at this point, nerding out with basketball. It's one of my favorite things to do. But that's not why I love talking to Mike, though it's up there. I love this conversation for a different reason. As I kind of alluded to in this conversation, I've personally struggled with this topic a lot, maybe more than any other episode. I have high expectations for myself. As a father, with my career, as a person, I want to be perfect. I want to be amazing. I want to succeed but I constantly fall short. I failed over and over and over. I didn't get that fellowship I wanted and I wanted it. No one likes the project I work my butt off on. I plan a full outing for me and my daughter, Liana, but then I forget the snacks at home and believe me, that girl gets hangry and I just get so mad at myself. You idiot, Noam, you really screwed this up. But Mike, Mike reminds me of the same thing we opened this episode with. Don et kol ha'adam lekaf zechut. See the full person. I keep thinking about what Mike said, what Mike's mentor told him, and he didn't really want to hear. But when you're at your lowest, it's hard to understand what's next, but you have to trust the process. Another basketball reference? I'm sorry. And believe that one day you'll look back and see this is the moment that changed your life. This is all part of your story. Those failures are a part of me, but the successes are too. I didn't get that fellowship, but hey, I got a different one and I made a lifelong best friend there. My project stunk, it really did, but I learned what to do differently. And the next time it was a hundred times better. And yes, I forgot the snacks, but then Liana and I got ice cream and we fed each other and giggled. Well, she giggled, I chuckled. It's not that I should forget the failures and only think about the successes. Both exist and both are a part of me and my story. The Power Of is a production of Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. Check out jewishunpacked.com for everything Unpacked related. And subscribe to our other podcasts. Follow Unpacked at all the social media places. Just look for at Jewish Unpacked. And most of all, write to us. Share your failures and successes alike at podcasts at jewishunpacked.com. This episode was produced by Rifki Stern and audio was Rob Perra. I'm your host, Noam Weissman. Thanks for listening.